Hey, this is Andy Jenkins with the Warrior Hope Podcast. Now, what we try to do every single week is, well, well, really there's kind of three formats that we've got. Number one is sometimes I bring you a service provider that is doing something incredible to serve veterans that has some wisdom, some expertise of something that you may need. Or if, if you don't need it, you might know someone or bump into someone who needs that bit of information. And so we bring these people to the table. We also bring uh, some incredible veterans to the table because I believe that there is power and healing and wholeness in story. And when you see someone else's story of radical redemption, when you see someone else's story of walking in wholeness, walking in freedom, even if they're not completely there yet, when you see that, it gives you hope and this sense that the same thing could be true for you too. And so we, we bring those stories together. And the third thing we do is a lot of times we just bring content of what we've been teaching, what we've been resourcing from the Warrior Hope curriculum, uh, from some of the other content that we're developing for Centers of Hope, from some of the other resources that we have. This week, I want to do that third, again, still with the goal of finding healing from the past and then identifying the next mission for the future. Uh, I want to do that. I don't want to build off of what General Jim Mukayama spoke about in the last episode when I was interviewing him. He really latched onto this idea that he's such an expert at, which is moral injury. And and in fact, he defined it, I, I think, in about 30 seconds in that podcast and made it super simple and, and talked about how when you must violate the conscience that that is that is your morals when you must violate that particularly in war so often it, it just it kind of injures the soul and it brings about really this moral injury just as the term is so here, here's the deal continuing from that interview in the previous episode with the general I, I want to discuss moral injury and it's a close counterpart to PTSD it often looks like it and manifests the same symptoms in similar ways but here's what you're going to see. Despite that cliche that you, you've probably heard this, if it looks like a duck, if it swims like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, then it's a duck. Well, when it comes to PTSD and moral injury, those two, they look similar on the surface, the symptoms, but they're very, very different. So it turns out if you treat someone for PTSD, yet they have moral injury, that treatment plan won't actually work. It will be ineffective. It's, it's really just like this. If someone has a broken leg um, and you treat a broken arm instead, or if they broke the right arm but you put a cast on the left arm, that treatment is going to be ineffective, okay? It's still body parts, it's still limbs, still appendages, but you've got to actually treat the wound. So here, you've got to address the actual issue. The goal, again, is to walk in total wholeness. So here's, here's what I want you to listen for. In this talk, I'm going to cover four main ideas that will help you understand and then seek help or even help others, if you don't need the help, that are struggling with moral injury. In my thinking, the more I study this and the more I interact with others and professionals in the sphere of emotional health, I believe that this is actually a bigger issue than PTSD. Moral injury, as you'll see, it goes to the root of who we are. It strikes at the heart of our identity. Okay, so to be clear, our emotions can be involved with moral injury and our spirits can be involved with PTSD. So listen for that. There's this unique soul connection between both. Uh, We're one person. Those are all parts of the soul. Anything having to do with one part can affect every other part. But I'm going to share with you some simplistic graphics and talk through. I'll put them on the show notes that are going to help you distinguish between the two. So I would encourage you, like, while you're listening, just take the link over to the website and just look at the graphics there in the show notes, okay? And since PTSD and moral injury are two different issues, they got to be addressed in different manners. PTSD must be addressed as being primarily a mental and emotional issue, whereas moral injury, though it may have an emotional component, here's what you're going to find. It's basically a moral or a spiritual issue. Okay, now here's here's one more thing to listen for. I know I'm kind of throwing a lot at you, kind of tossing the kitchen sink here right at you. Here's, here's what to listen for. Moral injury also deals with guilt and shame. Oddly enough, we're actually able to separate guilt and shame. Guilt is related to something we do that we've probably been told not to do, i.e., in the context of war, thou shalt not kill. Uh, shame, it results when we really have to grapple with who we are. Those two, 
they're related, but they're different. Okay, whereas guilt focuses on actions, that's what we do. Shame declares identity, who we are. People can repent of actions. I'm guilty, I just repent, I move on. But you can't really repent of an identity. And when you feel so guilty and carry it so long, like it creates this cloak, this sense, this identity of shame that becomes, oh, there it is, who you are. And an identity change requires that we do more than just rewrite a script, that we rewrite a story, that we rewrite our narrative. To, to change an identity, we, we must recast the character, or to say it another way, we must address those root causes and then start moving and changing, transforming for the inside out. So in this talk, listen for all of that. I'll be back after the talk with a few more notes for you. This is a piece of the puzzle. In fact, if you've seen the book Warrior Hope that we put together, that was really designed for veterans that were uh, coming back from deployment that uh, might be dealing with PTSD, might be dealing with the thing I want to talk to you about today, moral injury. Uh, th- that first three chapters really talk about just some of the mental and the emotional wounds that we carry. But let me define what moral injury is for you and, and kind of give you the main idea. All right, so uh, moral injury... The best way to understand that is is that while post-traumatic stress, it can cause emotional disruptions, many of the emotional disruptions that you see people dealing with, and I think I think the majority of the disruptions that you see people dealing with, I think they're actually the result not of post-traumatic stress disorder, but they're actually the result of moral injury. Here's the hitch with moral injury. Moral injury can't be diagnosed to anyone. And, and the reason it can't, it's it's real simple. It's It doesn't actually appear in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. Now, currently, they're on version 5, DSM-5. Uh, DSM-6, I, I don't know. I mean, that one may be out in a few years. That's kind of what everybody's kind of insinuating that it might be. And there's kind of hints and indications that moral injury will come up and be presented in the DSM-6. We don't know. But I do know that it is a real issue, and I think, uh, for reasons that I'm going to spell out in a second, that it is far more pervasive even than post-traumatic stress and some of the feelings type of things that we've talked about. Now, here's the deal with moral injury. If you treat moral injury like it is post-traumatic stress, the treatment will be ineffective because they're two different things. Okay, So that means that you got to consider it, and you got to approach it really on its own terms. Okay, so that, that's really what I want to do is in the next, uh, I don't know, 30, 40-ish minutes, I want to really introduce you to it, and I'm going to talk about it by giving you really four broad talking points. So if you're sitting down and you're listening and you want to take some notes, or if you're driving along and you have the way to kind of just flag or uh, put a bookmark, you might want to do that when you hear me kind of give you the numbers one, two, three, and four. Four points to this talk. Here's number one. Number one is this, signs that we see are not about the signs themselves. Signs always point to something else that we need to know. Now, we don't think a lot about this in America and the Western world, but in third world countries, this is a huge deal. In fact, you might remember the Princess Diana uh, when she was alive. Goodness, that's been over 20 years ago since she died. Mines and minefields were a huge issue for her. Now, You see the sign, and the sign says, danger, minefield ahead. That gives you a couple options. Here they are. Number one option, you've got three. Number one, you can ignore the sign. You can proceed. You can walk through the field and just hope for the best. That is a horrible proposition. Now, one time I was teaching that, somebody actually raised their hand. They're like, well, it depends on what's on the other side of the minefield. If there was somebody you're trying to get to, somebody you're trying to save, and it was like time was of the essence, man, you might just you might just push through it, and and that's true. Like depending on what's going on, uh, number one might be your option. Number two, accept the sign as truth, and then proceed, but proceed with caution. In other words, you don't ignore the sign. You realize that that and that, that might have been what that guy was more of getting at. It's probably accept the sign as truth, but then proceed with caution very, very fast. Option number three is you could stop and you take another route. You go around the field or you just try to figure it out. Here's something that you don't do, though. 
when you approach something and it has a sign like danger minefield, you don't make the sign itself the focus of your attention because you understand that the sign is not about the sign. The sign is pointing to a larger reality that you absolutely, for the sake of your own health and for the health and safety of the other people that are around you, you absolutely need to pay attention to. Now, think about that in the world of physical symptoms of, of your body. Okay, Physical symptoms in your body are really signs. And they're not about themselves. They're pointing you to a different reality altogether. I've, I've told some of you this story before. A couple years ago, uh, we had a zip line in our backyard, and I'd, I'd put it up when I uh, did some renovation in the backyard and reconfigured the deck, had some extra wood, and the kids had been begging for a zip line for years. And I, I told them, I said, well, if, if I've got extra wood from this and I can use that extra wood to build this platform over here, I'll build a ladder up this tree, build a platform, and then I'll go buy you a zip line to go across the yard from one side to the other. And so that's what happened. We had extra wood. I built a platform, uh, hung a zip line, and they started just kind of whizzing on it. You know, I mean, the new wore off in a couple years. But about three years ago, I think she was six, uh, Minnie. Minnie is uh, my youngest daughter. She's nine now. She is whizzing on the zip line. And at some point along the way, uh, she's probably six to eight feet off the ground. The pulley that's kind of rolling on the zip line it catches has a hitch she sinks forward swings back swings forward again loses her grip falls to the ground and kind of naturally just kind of reaches back and catches herself with her wrist well she gets up i mean she's tough <laughs> she dusts the grass off of her knees she gets it off her clothes she's crying a little bit pick her up hold her then she's feeling better and then she's feeling worse and then she's feeling better and then she's tired, so we take her upstairs, we let her get a bath. Just kind of call it. It's like 6, 7 o'clock. Let's just tap out for the night. Well, after she finishes taking the bath, she starts complaining about her wrist. The wrist that she landed on doesn't feel right, and it's starting to swell. And so here's what I did. I gave her some Advil. And then I told her, I'm going to take her down to the emergency room. We're going to go get an x-ray. We're going to check it out. And one of her sisters that had had a gymnastics accident before Ivy and who had been through all this routine, she jumps in the car for moral support. We go down, get it all checked out. We find out that Minnie is, number one, she's going to be okay. Um, but number two, that swelling was because she had sprained her wrist. Now, here's what I did not do. I did not say that pain, that physical symptom, is about the pain. The sign is about the sign. The pain became a sign to let me know, hey, something bigger is going on. I wasn't just going to give her the Advil to make the sign go away and then be done and go, oh, we're finished. I knew that sign is pointing me to a larger reality in this, just to use the metaphor, this field of things that I can't see. And so I need to accept the sign as truth, and then I need to move forward with caution. That's really kind of option number two, and really kind of look and see, hey, what, what's this sign showing me? What's going on here? And as a result of that, I found out something I didn't know, okay? Because point number one, signs are not about the signs themselves. The signs always point to something that we need to know. Emotional signs, they're the same way. Feelings, so that's going to be an emotional sign. Feelings aren't good or bad. Uh, we, we, like, <laughs> we like the good ones. We don't like the, quote, bad ones. They, they, they are really gauges to our soul the same that physical sensation is to our body. Okay, so feelings are to the soul what physical sensation is to the body. So there's not good sensation, bad sensation physically. Now, we, we like the good. We don't like the bad. I get it. I understand. I, me too. But the, quote, bad sensation, so you feel this burn when you touch a stove, that's letting you know, man, that thing's hot. Like, you need to not touch this. you got to pull your hand away because your hands are going to burn whether you feel the pain or not. So you need to feel that sensation so that you can accept it as truth and take caution from that sign that something's going on here. The same, the same is true physically with your body. You start getting shortness of breath or your right arm gets numb. You know, you know like, oh, that could be a sign of a heart attack. Or, or physical sensations that are good where you're, you, you 
feel a good sensation physically uh, after exercise. You have this euphoria. Or uh, I've talked about physical uh, intimacy, sex before. It, it's a good sensation, okay, where it's letting you know, hey, you're pleasant in this moment. Okay, so physical signs give us something that let us know what's going on in our world. They're not good or bad. They're neutral, okay? Um, and, and I know I know that, that, that I made something very simplistic out of all of that. Feelings are the same way. Not good or bad. Joy lets us know, hey, we're great in the moment. A physical sensation that causes, like from triggered PTSD, lets us know, hey, whoa, let's take a, a look because we've been in the situation before or in a situation that seemed like this and we didn't feel safe. Signs spiritually are are the same way. We shouldn't ignore the signs. We should deal with the signs as pointing to a greater reality. In other words, option number two may be the best. Accept the sign as truth, then proceed with caution. Here's point number two. Point number two is when, when, you, when you have a sign or a reaction, okay, and the, you're not flawed, the internal unrest that you feel is a natural response to the experience that you've encountered. So let me do this. Let me define conscience because when we talk about moral injury, we've got to deal with conscience. Here's what Webster says about the conscience. Webster says that conscience is, I'm just going to direct quote here, it's the sense of consciousness. So it's the sense of awareness of the moral goodness or blameworthiness of one's own conduct, one's own intentions, or one's character, together with a feeling of obligation to do right or wrong. So it's a sense of, of some, some things are good and some things are bad. And it can deal with your conduct, so it can deal with your actions, it can deal with your intentions, like it can deal with your conscience can let you know that the thing that you're about to do is exactly what you're going to do. That yes, you should help that person, or yes, you should give this money away, or yes, you fill in the blank of whatever you're going to do. Or your conscience can let you know that you're intending, you're about to do something that's going to be a foul ball that's not going to sit well with you. So if you lie about this, cheat on this, steal that, take that, hide this, cover up that, like it just gets kind of icky, you know. And so your conscience, again, can let you know intentions before it even happens. Uh, it even deals with your overall overarching character. So that's kind of the tenure of, of how you're living and again, this is all based on a feeling of obligation that we have to do right or to be good. Now, catch that last part, that we all have a feeling of obligation to do right or good. A couple years ago, I started reading a good bit of C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis is the one that wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. He, he says this in, in several of his writings. Now, and you got to remember, he, he was an atheist before uh, he became a Christian. He became a Christian later in life, converted, I mean, really, really solidly into his tenure as a professor uh, at Oxford. And he says this, that if you go study human cultures, like there is this code there there is this rule system this conduct basis that's written on the hearts of all people and so you study cultures that are in different time eras that are on different continents different countries where people speak different languages have different customs different way of doing things different holidays different celebrations different family and society and business structures and all of those things educated in different ways different language yet the human code is essentially the same. In every culture, across every time period, thou shalt not kill. You shouldn't steal. You shouldn't lie. You should honor your mother and father. Now, I'm just kind of quote, quoting Ten Commandments. But those are, are commonalities across all cultures. And in fact, when people step out of those, like they, they tend to be like people that we isolate and go, well, man, they, they were really psychotic. Like they, they didn't fit the norm because the norm is this feeling of obligation that's inside of all people. And I would say it's the image of God inside of all people to do right, to do good. You, you actually see it if you have a Bible when you open up to Romans 1, you see it where Paul says that the law of God, and, and that's what he refers to it as. 
He's like, you don't, you don't need the Ten Commandments. I mean, it's, it's good and it gives you an external basis to kind of see what you already thought to be true, that there's this right and wrong, there's this moral compass that's inside of you. If you watched cartoons when you were growing up, you, you probably saw on people's shoulders, on one shoulder there's an angel and the angel's kind of begging and pleading, oh, no, 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 do this, do this. It's, it's telling and begging somebody to do right. And on the other side, there's this devil, generally red with a pitchfork, cape, horns, begging, telling the people, chiding them to do wrong. That's the conscience. And what Webster's Dictionary, again, completely secular, this isn't a religious source, is saying is, is to do the right thing, is the natural bent of people. Now, I'm a Dr. Rita Brock, who is an expert in moral injury. Uh, I mean, she's been featured, speaks for the VA, speaks on the national scene, has written books, uh, just an incredible authority on this. And speaking about soldiers, she says this. I'm going to change up the quote a little bit. I'll tell you when I'm changing it, but this is her quote. She says, Moral injury, it results when soldiers violate their core moral beliefs. Now, now I might change that up and say moral injury results when, because I'm not just talking to soldiers or warriors now, I'm speaking to all people here kind of on this podcast. Moral injury results when, I would just say, anyone, when people violate their core moral beliefs. And in evaluating their behavior negatively, so you you kind of take stock of what you did, they feel they can no longer live in a reliable meaningful world and can no longer be regarded as decent human beings. So so just kind of stop right there in the quote. You, you might have heard the phrase before. You might have even said it. Like you, you did something and you're like, oh man, a- after that, I I just felt despicable. Like after that, like I, I just felt like I needed to take a shower or wash something off or I needed to repent or I needed to you, you might like that even use religious language even if you're not religious you like because there's this thing inside of you um, she continues they may feel they may feel this even if what they did was warranted and unavoidable so now she's speaking in soldier world a lot of times soldiers have to take orders from someone above them. So I'll give you a good example. One of my friends, uh, J.T. Cooper. J.T. was one of the soldiers that was in Black Hawk Down. Not in the film. He was actually there on the ground and was fighting as as a soldier. He's talking on the Honoring the Code documentary about moral injury, and he says something like this. He says that the first time he looked down the scope of a rifle, there was a man that was really pelting at American soldiers from amidst a crowd. And his sergeant looks at him and says, Cooper, take him out. And he says, I looked at my sergeant. It was the middle of the broad daylight. And he said, sir. And the sergeant said, take him out. And JT looks, and the guy is continuing to like shoot at American soldiers. Like he's, It's warranted. It's unavoidable. If JT doesn't pull the trigger, this guy is going to take lives from people. And so the sergeant says the third time, take him out. And then JT complies and actually does what was warranted, what was unavoidable. But as I talked to him and I talked to others, Colonel Reitzel, who's a ranger, who's in his 70s now, who's been on countless missions, they say the first time that you have to do something like that, it feels awkward, it feels not right. And then, and, and this, is, this is their experience. So this, there, there may be other experience from other people, okay? This is just these two men. It's not right. And then the more you do it, the more normal it becomes. And yet, the more disconnected from humanity you feel. Even though it was something that was warranted, that was unavoidable, that you had to do. And what what they're getting at is this feeling of conscious violation, moral injury. Dr. Brock continues. She says this, one more sentence. The consequences of violating one's conscience, even if the act was unavoidable or seemed right at the time, it can be devastating. Now, let me kind of put a, it's not a sub point, it's just kind of another thing in here, because she, she referred to something. She says that violating your core beliefs, even if it's unavoidable. So th- this might happen kind of in nor- normal world if your parents told you to do something, or a boss told you to do something, or uh, a husband told you to do something, or a wife told you to do something, and you kind of had to do it to keep the peace. It, it might also happen, too, if you were abused, 
And so in that case, you're the victim, but someone, and I'm thinking maybe in the case of sexual abuse, somebody does something to you that violates your core belief, okay, that this is reserved exclusively for a man and a woman in the confines of a consensual romantic relationship. Now all of a sudden somebody violates that. You're not guilty. This was done against you, yet there still may be some kind of disconnect there where you you feel something, but, and you feel feel something in the soul. That's the kind of thing that she's getting at with moral injury. Now, point number one, let me kind of build it all back together. Number one, signs are not about signs themselves. They point to something greater than the sign that we need to know. So we don't want to ignore them. We want to proceed with caution. Number two, if you've got a sign of unrest in the soul, particularly the spirit, you're not flawed. The internal unrest that you feel is a natural response to the experience that you've encountered. That's number two. Number three is this. Moral injury manifests as feelings of guilt and shame. Or I could say it another way. Uh, Guilt and shame are the signs. Guilt and shame are pointing you to something deeper that you need to know. Like you don't want to ignore it. You don't want to stop and go around it. You want to see the sign and not just go, oh, it's guilt. For the sake of guilt. Oh, it's shame for the sake of shame. Like you want to deal with it, proceed with caution, and then move forward. Now, l- let me kind of give you a footnote here. In the previous talk, I chatted about post-traumatic stress disorder. And that came up as a fight or flight response. Moral injury is a little bit different. I'm going to put a graphic down in the show notes where you can see it. Moral injury brings about feelings of guilt and shame. So the signs for both of these are different. But many times the symptoms, like how it will exhibit in a person, is going to be very similar. And so it's going to be easy to get these two confused. Like um, I'll put this graphic down in the show notes where you can see it as well. So because these are wounds on or wounds, I, I would even say, in the soul, like they go in and they start feeling, filling you with this, this, it, it's a toxic feeling is what it is. Think of your soul as this balloon that's blowing up, okay? Uh, so like at a birthday party, when you get a balloon, you just start blowing into it, just blowing into it. You know, when it gets bigger, you get bigger. At some point, there gets to be enough pressure on that balloon that a couple things are going to happen. Number one, you can hold the edges of it uh, at the mouthpiece and the air just squeals and shrills out and it just is uh, just this loud, ongoing, just this whiny, shrill, eek, squeal, however you want to say it. Over time, it is this horrible outpouring. You can probably draw the correlation with PTSD or moral injury with that. Number two, um, another option with the balloons, you just let it go. It just flies off, disappears. You never hear from it again. You could probably draw the correlation there as well. Option number three is you just keep blowing. You know, more pressure in. Eventually, too much pressure, the thing explodes. Okay. These are symptoms of what happens as that thing is either shrilling or exploding. Number one, anger. Uh, Number two, anxiety. Number three, depression. Number four, insomnia. can happen either way. Or if you can sleep, it might be bad dreams. Nightmares. Uh, Number six, self-medication. Number seven, withdrawal. Those are all common symptoms with moral injury and post-traumatic stress disorder. So if you feel either one of those, or if you exhibit any of those, would be a better way to say If you exhibit any of those, you you might automatically divert and go, well, it's post-traumatic stress. I'm angry, or I'm anxious, or I'm down, I'm depressed, or I can't sleep, or I'm having nightmares, night terrors, I'm I'm self-medicating, like I'm having to self-medicate with drugs or alcohol or sex, or having to self-medicate with going to the gym, or having to self-medicate with, you know, binge-watching Netflix, or things that are even good, but... They're just band-aiding something that they can't band-aid, right? Even things that you're given to enjoy, like social media would be another one, or withdrawing. If you're exhibiting those symptoms, you might automatically think it's post-traumatic stress, but what I'm saying is like the symptoms could be the result not of fight or flight. They could be the result of covering up guilt and shame. 
when you have moral injury, again, graphic in the show notes, uh, it results in guilt and shame because, number one, your conscience is violated. That means somewhere something was done by you or something happened to you that really goes against kind of the stack pole, the plumb line, the norm of what you feel to be right and wrong. And number two, because of that, um, you have these feelings that kind of associate with that that may make you feel unworthy or make you feel even less than human. Uh, a soldier that was interviewed uh, with Crosswinds with the Invisible Scars. Now, Invisible Scars was the, was the film about post-traumatic stress disorder. And so we're interviewing this guy, and he's talking on and on about, well, I went to the VA, and I really thought I had post-traumatic stress disorder. I was, he exhibited the classic symptoms. I'm, I'm lashing out at my ex-wife, who's now his ex-wife. Anger, just intense angry. Um, I'm anxious all the time, and yet then I'm feeling depressed when I'm not anxious. Like, I'm vacillating between these two extremes. I can't sleep at night, and then when I do sleep, it's just these constant flashbacks. And, and then I start self-medicating. He said, I start smoking. Like, I smoked so much that, like, I didn't even think it was possible to smoke that much. So he's going through just a list of the classic symptoms that I've just listed for you. And then he goes in, and then he fails the test. Like, he literally thinks he has post-traumatic stress disorder. The people that are in his family think he has PTSD. He thinks he has PTSD. People in his church think he has PTSD. He goes in there, he takes the test, he fails, and then as he describes his story, the way we've got it on film, he describes it, and he starts describing that I just couldn't reconcile the things that I had done and the things that I had seen. And I'd given myself a lot of negative talk. I didn't need anybody else to tell me I was unworthy. I had already told myself I was unworthy. When he describes his story in those terms, you look at it and go, oh, they, they were right. He doesn't have PTSD. He has moral injury. His conscience has been violated because of the things that he did, which he was ordered to do. He was in war. He had to do them. And as a result... He's walking around feeling unworthy. He has this wound on the soul that is spiritual, that is emotional, and, and it's core to being human. It is core to, we've got this, theologians would call it this imago di. We, we've got this image of this design of God that's on the soul. Now, that said, guilt and shame uh, a little bit more under point number three about moral injury manifesting, the signs of that being guilt and shame. Uh, let, let, me, let me describe the difference of those. Guilt is based on an action. It's based on I did something, uh, meaning uh, a, a, a guilt would be a response to something that you do. Uh, the thing that you do, it may actually be out of character for you. So it might have been something that you normally wouldn't do, but then you did it. Um, like normally you wouldn't. You, you wouldn't, just to use this example, uh, normally JT wouldn't pull the trigger and shoot someone, but when that someone is shooting at American soldiers and other civilians that he has to defend, all of a sudden he does that, killing someone out of character for him, but he had to do it in the moment. Um, so it could be something out of character for you, or it could have been something that's based on circumstances. Here, here's, here's something I learned I think I've known this for a long time, but I, but I finally put language on it maybe in the last year. I, I grew up in a really legalistic background. I grew up Southern Baptist, and I, I say that. I'm, I'm not bitter about that. I'm actually grateful for that. There were for sure some things that I had to work through, but, I mean, for goodness, from the past, who doesn't have things to work through, right? And looking back in, in the background of the rearview mirror, I mean, it gave me an appreciation for Scripture. It gave me an appreciation for community, appreciation for honor, for respect, for integrity, for even things that later on in life I violated. I can trace back the norm, the stack pole of always going back to truth and being anchored in that from that background where I grew up. Now, here's one thing that I picked up from a legalistic background is that sin, wrong, violating the human code, uh, violating the image of God that's in us, that standard, is black and white. I, I always thought that. Over the last year, I'm starting to see that, for the most part, that's still true, black and white, but you will never understand someone's black and white decision apart from understanding the story 
and the circumstances in which that decision to do that black or white thing was made. Because circumstances in life exist in all kinds of shades of gray. And so in any given situation, somebody might do something that would normally be against their code of behavior, but somehow something greater trumps it, and all of a sudden, again, it doesn't excuse it. It just in the moment makes it seem like the best, even regrettable, but best option. And because of that, a lot of people carrying around a lot of guilt, a lot of just this moral injury thing. Okay, and, and again, I think I've already told you, moral injury, I, I, I think it's probably a bigger deal than post-traumatic stress disorder um, because it gets kind of that core definition of what it means to be human. And post-traumatic stress disorder, like it, post-traumatic stress deals with externals. It deals with a response, a reaction, a fight or flight in response to something that happened, a response to something that came at you, something like that. It's a response to that. You can get away from that, but moral injury, like that guilt, that stuff, it rides, it goes with you constantly because you know the phrase, <laughs> wherever you go, there you are, right? Um, so guilt, that that's guilt. It's based on an action. I did something. Shame is really rooted on, based on identity. It would be this, I am something. Not I did something, I am something. Now, generally that's the result of I did something, but shame could also be the result of something was done to me. Shame is different than guilt. Uh, Whereas guilt is based on something you do, shame gets at the root of who you are. Okay, it's different than doing a, a, quote, bad thing. Shame denotes that you're a bad person, perhaps not even valued uh, as, as being a human. So when you start having people feel and walk in shame, uh, they're, they're, again, they're, they're going to feel depressed. They're going to feel guilty. They're going to feel worthless. They're going to feel this remorse they can't overcome, this despair, this unable to connect with others emotionally, these suicidal tendencies. And, and you might look at that because there's common symptoms with PTSD and moral injury. You might look at it and go, it's PTSD. It might not be. It might be shame. And, and here's, here's one of the big issues with shame and guilt is both of these, like both of these two demons, they like the dark. They like staying in the closet. And coming out into the light where, where, where the person is accepted, where the person is embraced, where the person is welcomed and loved, it eradicates and it shames shame. It squelches and silences shame. Yet there's this huge fear of, of coming out into the open. Now, all that said, uh, let, let, me, let me land it and... Um, because we'll, we'll keep talking. I'll, I'll come back and tell you more on another day. Here, here's what's bad, not interesting. It's, that's the wrong word. It's, it's probably ultra-revealing that point number four, experts on moral injury from diverse backgrounds, they all agree on a common cure for it. Now, again, because it's not post-traumatic stress, if you try to treat it like post-traumatic stress, you're not going to get a result. Like, it's not going to go away. Um, just like if you try to treat moral injury as if it's post-traumatic stress. Like, it's not, like, it's, it's or try to treat post-traumatic stress as if it's moral injury. It's not going to go away, okay? So, you think about it. Like, let me, let me give you the correlation. Uh, your physical body has physical signs. We've got to listen to those signs, see what they're saying, and then treat the body in order to cure the body, if we've got an emotional wound, we've got to listen to the feelings, the signs, see what the feelings say, and then we've got to treat the emotions in order to heal the emotions and find wholeness. When your soul has wounds, and your soul is eliciting a sense of guilt and eliciting a sense of shame, we've, we've got to treat those, not, not the signs, but see what the signs are saying and say, hey, the sign of guilt and the sign of of shame is a wound on the soul. We've got to treat the soul. If we try to treat the feelings, that'd be PTSD. If we try to treat the feelings, it's not going to fix the soul. Uh, just like if we try to fix the soul, it's not going to fix the body. Now, now I, I know, 
Um, we can pray, and we do, and sometimes miracles happen. And what it does, man, it is amazing, yet we still walk out in wholeness. So we've got to, treat, we've got to still treat uh, and teach people how to walk out health physically, how to walk out health emotionally, and how to walk out health spiritually from the soul. Okay, ho- hopefully that made sense. I- I'm thinking it in my head, and I can see it in my head. I'm hoping that it's translating via audio <laughs> to where like, you-, you can get it from my voice. So here's here's the deal. Experts say, here's how you treat wounds on the soul. And this is experts from all theological backgrounds, all religious backgrounds, and not even just from denominational backgrounds. Like denominations tend to be sex within a given religion. So like, you know, my religion's Christianity, so denominations would be like Baptist, it's a denomination. You know, we'd say like Catholic, we'd say that's a denomination. Methodist, that's a denomination. You know, uh, Presbyterian, that's a denomination. There's sex within Christianity. So this isn't even something that like sex within the same religion. Sex, S-E-C-T-S, not sex, S-E-X. Okay, sex denominations in the religion. Like, th- this is not even something that they agree on only. Like, people that are of different religions agree on, and people that aren't even religious. Like, they're atheists that we've been able to kind of track and see and honoring the code and invisible scars that agree, agree on this. And, and this is where it gets ultra-revealing to me because this goes back to the fact that I think that there is an image of God on everyone and there's this, this, this common law in our heart and a common cure when that law is broken. And, and here it is. They all say that the cure, and, and they say it's all too uncommon because people tend to hide because they're afraid they won't be accepted. They say the cure is forgiveness. That freedom from moral injury, um, which, which, by the way, can manifest as survivor's guilt, um, moral injury can manifest as it should have been me, not them. Uh, moral injury can manifest as I've done something that's so horrible that if I told anybody, they would never accept me. And so I'm going to keep this in the closet locked away for the rest of my life type stuff. Forgiveness is freedom. Now, again, the hindrance, the hindrance to that is the two culprits that are the signs that you have moral injury in the first place. Guilt, uh, I did something so horrible it can't be forgiven that God won't even accept me, or shame. I I am horrible. Not Not just I did something, but I am something. And what would people think of me if they knew? Shame says they would write you off. And what we're seeing is just the opposite is true, that somehow that letting it into the light People tend to run to and rally to and embrace that and accept that. Now, now I'm not saying you should overshare it. I'm not saying this goes on a Facebook post. I am saying this goes to the few that embrace you, the few that will accept you, the few that will walk with you through this and remind you that you're forgiven. Um, I, I'll tell you who that can be in a second. Let me let me tell you a story that illustrates this. Um, so I was watching films. And in that, uh, I came across a story where this woman named Lou Ann talks about her son who was over in Iraq. He would regularly be able to call home when he was on mission. And he called one night, and she says, he is just weeping. He is distraught. And instantly, she is the, she is the mom. She's like, and he's tough. Like, he is a warrior. And all of a sudden, like, he is broken. And she she said, what, what's going on? Are you okay? And he says, I'm, I'm not. We were out there and something happened. It's horrible. Can you get me home? And do you know anybody that can get me home? And, you know, this, this took her by complete shock, completely surprised because he's tough. He's, he's strong. And she says, well, are you okay? And he says, I'm not. I'm not. Well, are you physically okay? And he says, yes, physically I'm fine. That was one of the things that she was thinking, maybe like something had happened to him that was kind of physically catastrophic. And he says, no, physically I'm okay, something's happened. And she has to pull the story out of him. Here's what happened. They were on patrol, and they had to break into uh, a compound. And when they broke in, because there were a lot of enemy combatants in there that were storing weapons and using those weapons and uh, fueling them out to other supply places where they were fighting you know, insurgents, um, they they. they, they they got there, which was a stronghold, which was a, a kind of a fortress, a fort for the insurgents. And when they went in and broke in, 
they, they instantly, they started taking gunfire. And so they started firing back, and he had to. So this was in the call of duty. This was something he was designed to do. He was trained to do. He had to do. And he sees a six and a half foot tall figure with the gun that starts firing on him. And so he fires back and instantly, immediately takes the combatant out. Now, dust was flying everywhere. Uh, you could hardly see. It was hazy. And after they cleared the scene, he gets over there. And he learns that that combatant that was firing at them had been using a child as a human shield. And so when he killed the combatant, he took out the child unknowingly as well. Um, th this, as you could imagine, it, it devastated him. Uh, after the deployment, he finished it. He came back and he was suicidal. He attempted to kill himself multiple times. He didn't have shell shock from the war. It wasn't an emotional thing he's dealing with where he hears a backfiring car and he instantly takes cover. It's not a thing where he hears fireworks, which is a real deal, and all of a sudden he feels like there's gunfire. It, it was literally that soul wound that not only, not only did I kill someone, the code is, the human code is men look out for women and kids first, and I killed an innocent. I took the life of a child. The story is that he went to a uh, rehabilitation center of sorts, a retreat center. And one evening, uh, there were several of them in a meeting, and he ended up in the middle of the group at the end. And several of them were there, and they started praying for him. Uh, others were there that weren't even religious that looked at him in the eye and said, man, there is nothing else you could have done. And then they used the language, your forgiven of this. You're released of this burden. And as other people in unison just started saying, yes, you're forgiven. Be, be done with this. You are forgiven. Lay this burden down. He walked out of the room completely transformed, completely new. And so experts look back on stories like this and they say, well, who has the ability to grant forgiveness? And here's who it is. It is someone that the victim of moral injury believes has the authority or the credibility to grant, to gift them the forgiveness. So it's different for different people. Like for some people, it may actually be a pastor, a priest, or a rabbi. For others, it could be a former coach. It could be an officer they served under. It could be sometimes the warriors call the people that they serve with battle buddies. It could be a battle buddy. It could be anyone that's a perceived authority in that person's life that has the moral fortitude, the fiber, to grant the, the wish and say, you're forgiven. Walk free of guilt. Walk released of shame. Now, I, I know like that might have just flipped some religious people, Christian people in particular, in a tailspin. And I was kind of searching on this and thinking, you know, if, if this is true, if this is in the human code, if this is, we are created in the image of God, and we're created for health, we're created for wholeness, and this is, in my mind, a legitimate way that wounds happen and a way freedom happens, where can I find it in the Bible? After Jesus resurrected from the dead, he appeared to the disciples. Now, you remember Peter and John and the others, they raced to the empty tomb after the women got there first and told them. Then the men kind of race and go see. And then after they see the resurrected Jesus, they are the empty tomb, they go back and they lock themselves in. They lock themselves in the upper room for fear that they'll be killed. And while they're there, that evening, Jesus appears to them through the doors, like through the locked doors, through the walls, and they think he's a ghost. And he said, they says, no, no, look at, my, look at my hands, look, my side, look at my scars, like, look, this is, you know, the, it's me. He eats some fish, he shows them proofs that he's alive, and then he, Scripture, John says this, he breathes the Holy Spirit on them, and then he says, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. Now, now think about that. The Pharisees, in the time of Jesus, when Jesus would forgive sins, they'd say, who can forgive sins but God alone? And they'd get angry when Jesus forgave sins. And now, like people in our culture, look around and go, well, only God, only Jesus can forgive sins. Like Jesus saves. Yes, true. And by the work of he did on the cross, he saves. Salvation's here. It comes. But who can forgive sins? Jesus actually says, in the book of John, in the gospel, he says, you can forgive sins. And if you release somebody of the guilt and shame they're carrying, they're released.
I mean, you think about that. Like, the creator of the universe knew that you and I have this law on our hearts and that at some point, because life is beautiful and it is good, but it is so incredibly hard that at some point that code is going to get broken and it's going to be like, what else can we do? Where can we go? And he says, you can turn because of what I've done to each other. And you can pronounce grace, peace, freedom, deliverance, healing from guilt, from shame, from anything over one another. Well, there you go. I hope this was helpful for you. And I I, I hope that it's helpful for you, not just to understand it for you, but also if you see somebody struggling in this area and and you may see people struggling, not just that are warriors, but this one, guilt, shame, condemnation, broken identity, fractured soul. This can happen with anyone, anywhere. I'd love for it if you do me a favor. If you would go and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, wherever you listen to this episode, that helps us because those providers then know what content to shuffle and put up to the front and then share with other people. While you're there, if you would leave us a review, just leave us an honest one. That would be fantastic. Doesn't have to be five stars, though we would love four or five stars. Go to our website while you're here too, because that will give you access to our free PTSD self-assessment. There you can take a three minute, some some people even do it in two minutes, 10 questions, yes or no. They're gonna help identify whether you're dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder or here's the reality most people are not most people are not diagnosable but if you had 70 percent lung capacity you would think something's wrong with your breathing if you had 50 percent use of, of an arm you would think why well, i need to get some physical therapy like i need to increase that like something's broken there and in our soul any wound on the soul our emotions it deserves to be treated in the same way that you would focus on physical wounds so go take the ptsd self-assessment and here here's what i would say with that too if you look at that and you say well this doesn't seem to check out then, then great if you still feel that there's this wound on the soul it may be that you're dealing with an issue of moral injury If that's the case, I would encourage you to reach out for help. Our contact info is down below. The film, Honoring the Code, about moral injury, the link to that, also down below. We would love to walk with you because here's the reality. We are better together.